What's up everyone? Welcome to part two of our TensorFlow basics tutorial series. And in this one, we're going to look at logistic regression using the MNIST data set. So in this video, we're going to build upon the previous one and learn how to classify these handwritten digits. We've got a lot to cover, so let's get started. So in this video, we're going to be looking at logistic regression and we're going to be using the classic MNIST data set. And logistic regression, at least the way I understand it, is we're going to be trying to predict categorical data. So is it good? Is it bad? Is it a 1, a 2, a 3? We're trying to classify the stuff rather than just fitting points on a line. So we've got a lot to cover. Let's jump into it. So I've got my new notebook open. I'm just going to start with the imports and I'm just going to paste them to save time. So we're going to import TensorFlow STF, NumPy as MP, matplotlib, and this little thing here just to make our graphs look nicer. Next, we need to download the data set itself. So I'm just going to call it X train Y train, and we're going to put that in as a tuple. Then we're going to download X um, test and Y test, and that's going to be equal to TF dot Keras dot data set data sets with an S MNIST dot load underscore data. So when you run that, it'll download the data set. So I've already done that, but if you haven't, you'll see a little status thing telling you you've downloaded everything. Now I just want to quickly visualize what the data set looks like. So let's just plot a few of them just to see what we're working with. So we'll do fig comma axes is equal to plt dot subplots and we'll do um, one by four and fig size let's um, let's set it equal to seven by three then um, let's do a loop so for um, image comma label comma ax in and what we're gonna zip up is Let's look at some of the training samples. So we'll look at the first four. Then for the labels, it'll be Y train, um, and it'll be the first four. And then we'll pass the axes themselves. Then what we'll do is ax.setTitle, and the title is just gonna be the label. And then let's just call I am show, and we'll show the image. And I'm just going to do ax.axis off just to turn off the little numbers on the side. Finally, we'll do plt.show. So here you can see the first four of the training set. We've got a five, a zero, a four, and a one. Now what I want to do is just take a look at what the shape of all these things is, um, like the shape of X train, Y train, all those things. So I've just got this print statement right here. We're just going to print out the shape of each of them, and I'm using an F string for that. So we'll run that. And you can see that we've got 60,000 training images and corresponding 60,000 labels. And then for our test images, we've got 10,000 and 10,000 labels. And all our images are 28 by 28. So that's what the shape is. Now we need to do a little bit of pre-processing. So the pre-processing -pro pre that we're going to do is we're going to flatten all the images and we're going to scale them from 0 to 1. So right now they go from 0 to 255. So we'll rescale them. So the way we can do that is we're just going to redefine X train. It's going to be equal to X X train, and we're going to call reshape, and we're going to re reshape it to 60,000 by um, well, it's going to be 28 times 28, which is the same thing as 784, and then we're going to divide the whole thing by 255. And we'll do the same thing to x test. So it's going to be equal to x test dot reshape. Um, and it'll be 10,784 divide everything by 255. Now for the labels, we need to make them a one hot array. So 
if I were to, let's just go ahead and run this. If I were to look at the labels, so let's do Y train and let's just look at the first, um, let's look at the first four. So you can see we get a five, a zero, a four, and a one. But in this case, we don't want a five. We want say like zero, zero, zero. We want the fifth one to be a one and the rest to be zeros. So that's what a one hot array is. So I'll show you how we can do that. Um, let's go ahead and delete this. So we're actually gonna use a TensorFlow session to do this one hot conversion. So we'll go ahead and call we with tf dot capital S session as sesh. We're going to call sesh dot run and what we're gonna run is tf dot one underscore hot and we're just gonna pass it y train and then we need to specify how many categories there are and in our case there's gonna be 10. So we're gonna do the same thing for um, y test so let's just copy paste make this test and then um, actually we also need to put this out front just so we can get the stuff out when we're done with the session so yeah so now if we run this and we look at y train and just take the first four you can see that instead of a five, we get the, the fifth index, we get a one. For this one, we get a, the first index is a, or the zero index is a one. So this is what we mean by one hot. Instead of just like five, zero, four, one, we get this array that has 10 elements and like the fifth one or the sixth one is where the one shows up. So that's what one hot means. Now I'm gonna go ahead and define a few hyperparameters. So I'm just gonna copy and paste these. So our hyperparameters, we've got learning rate, it's gonna be 0 0.01. The number of epochs is gonna be 50. Batch size, 100. And we're gonna define this thing called batches. And it's just going to be X train. Remember the first element was 60,000. So it's gonna be 60,000 divided by the batch size. So we'll see where this comes into play later. So I'll go ahead and run that. So the next thing we would do is we would define our X, our Y, our weights, and our bias. But before we do that, I wanna briefly talk about what the input shape and the output shape is and how we can determine what the shape of our weights and our bias needs to be. So to do that, I'm gonna go ahead and copy a little bit of LaTeX math for us just to kind of help us see what this stuff looks like. So I'm going to change this to a markdown cell and I'm just going to copy and paste all this stuff because it'll take too long to write. So we've all seen this before, our y equals x times w plus b. But this time what we're going to do is we're also going to add this sigma and this is going to be our soft max and we'll see how that comes into play later. But We've already seen what our Y shape is. So our Y, well, if we're just going to take one of them, it's just going to be a list that's 10 elements long. So Y is going to have 10 elements, you can see here. And our X, we've already seen that as well. We've gone ahead and flattened it. So we did the flattening, and it's just going to be an element that's 784 long. So here our X goes from 1 to 784. So if we want to take this quantity, x times w and we really want to turn it into something that's 10 elements long if we were to multiply something that's you can think of this as 1 by 784 if we multiply it by something that's 784 by 10 the output is going to be something that's 10 elements long so you just kind of take the 784 and we get the 10 out of it but that's how we can determine what the shape of w needs to be and because we're just going to be adding the bias, the bias term is just going to be 10 elements long. So our W is going to be 784 by 10, and our bias is just going to be 10. So let's go ahead and define all these inputs. So the first thing, let's bring this up a little bit. So X is our, it's going to be our flattened 
and normalized images. So the flattening and the normalization, this is the pre-processing we did above. So I put the pre-processing steps in quotes and then also our Y is our one hot labels. So for Y, the pre-processing was just turn it into a one hot array. So let's go ahead and define X as capital X and it's gonna be tf.placeholder. The type is going to be float tf.float32. And remember, we need to define our shape. So the first thing is gonna be none and it's gonna be 784. So this will always be none and then we put the actual shape of a single image here. Now, let's go ahead and do Y. So it's basically the same thing, except the shape is gonna be 10. So we've got our X and Y. Let's do our W and our bias. So W is gonna be TF dot variable and we need to initialize it with some numbers. So in my case, I'm gonna start with um, random numbers just like we did before. So mp.random.randn and the shape we're gonna pass, remember, we said it's gonna be 784 by 10. And I'm just going to also change the type of this because it also has to be type 32. So I'm just gonna call as type um, np.float32. So we can go ahead and do the same thing for our bias term. So in this case, we can just pass a 10 here because it's just gonna be a list that's 10 long and the type's gonna be the same. So when you're setting up these inputs, the variables, these are the things that we're gonna be training for or they're gonna be the things that we're going to learn. And the placeholders, these are our our data, our input data. So our images and our labels, or in the case of our previous example, the X coordinates and the Y coordinates. Yeah, try and remember that. These are your training things, the things we wanna learn, and this is your data. So let's go ahead and run that cell. Next, we're gonna define our graph, our cost function, and our optimizer. So our graph or our prediction, or as we call it, pred, it's gonna be basically the same as our previous one. So we're gonna do tf.add, and we're also gonna do tf.matmol. So we're gonna be multiplying matrices, and the matrices we're gonna be multiplying is x times w, and what we're gonna be adding is the bias. So this is pretty much the same as our previous video's um, prediction function but we're gonna wrap this thing in a softmax function. So we're gonna call tf.nn.softmax. And this is what's key to doing categorical or logistic regression. So that's our prediction function. Next, we're gonna define our cost function. So we're gonna call it cost. And this may look a little confusing at first, but just stick with me. So it's gonna be tf.reduceMean. So what we're gonna be taking the mean of is minus tf.reduceSum. And what we're gonna be taking the sum of is y times the log. So it'll be tf.log of the prediction. And for this sum, we need to specify an axis. So the axis is gonna be one. So that's our cost function. And it may look a little confusing and maybe you're not sure why we chose this, but now what I wanna do is take a minute to sort of go through it step by step to show you how this cost function works. So I'm just gonna go ahead and run this cell, and this one, I'm gonna make it a markdown cell and just put some LaTeX math here. So we've got our cost function is equal to the sum of minus y times the natural log of our prediction. So let's start by just taking a look at what the natural log function looks like. So I'm just gonna copy and paste this stuff in here. So we've got a variable x and we're just gonna go from basically zero to one and it'll be a hundred points. And the reason why I didn't do zero is because natural log is undefined at zero. And then we're just gonna plot x and natural log of x. So we'll run that. 
So you can see that at zero, this thing blows up to negative infinity, but then at one, the function's equal to zero. So how does this work as a cost function? Well, let's go ahead and generate some sample data. So I'm gonna generate some sample labels and some sample predictions. So I'm just gonna scroll down here and I'm gonna copy and paste some of this stuff here. So I've got some um, array called A. This is gonna be our prediction. So let's go ahead and just call this pred. And then let's define another one. And this will be our labels. So B will be our labels. Let's look at our labels. So we've got zero, zero, one, and zero. So this is would be a label for say three. And this would be a label for, actually this would be a label for two. This would be a label for zero. So then if we're trying to predict this for say this one, we would get, we should get low scores when it's a zero and a high score or close to one when it's a one or when this is a one. And same thing for this one, it should be, um, well in this case, I'm doing a correct, doing an incorrect prediction. So it's not detecting the right one. So let's see what happens when we multiply these things. So let's do A times B. So here, um, because we've got zeros here, they're always gonna be zeros. So no matter what, we'll get zeros when we multiply this one times this one. You'll see that the first two are zero and the last one is zero. So the only one that's gonna be non-zero is this times whatever this is. So basically we're taking the log of this. So the log of something close to one is gonna be a zero. So when we're correct, we should get a very low number. It should be close to zero. But when we're incorrect, so in this case, we're gonna take one, the only one we're gonna get is this value. So we're gonna get um, some number that, when we take the log of this, it's gonna be some really big negative number. So we get some you know, kind of big negative number. So our log function or our cost function, we have this negative sign. So if I just add, that negative sign in there. Now we get all positive values. So you can see that the correct prediction is some low value and the incorrect prediction is some high value. Now the only thing left to do is sort of sum this thing up. So we can use NumPy to do these same functions. And really, I mean, I think it would be better if they just called it sum instead of reduce sum and mean instead of reduce mean, because that's all we're really doing is summing and averaging. So in this case, I'm going to define something called R sum, and it's going to be equal to NP dot sum. And what we're going to take the sum of is this um, minus a times B, and the axis is going to be equal to one. So this is the same. Let me just collapse this. So this is the same as this. We're just doing, we're getting this minus reduced sum here axis one. So if I were to run this, you can see that all we're doing is just taking this thing, this um, array, and we're compressing it down into one value and the same for this. So we're just taking the, we're just selecting the one. So here it goes to there, this one goes to here. So the next thing to do is take the mean. So I'll call it our mean, and that's going to be equal to NP dot mean and what we're going to take the mean of is our sum so what I'll do is let's print this and then let's print our mean so now all we're doing is just taking the average value of these two things so now the whole point is to bring this thing down into a scalar value. So we just get a single scalar value for the cost. So that's all this, this sum and reduce mean are doing, just sort of bringing it down to a scalar value. So don't get confused by all these extra operations. And finally, just to prove to you that the TF version of this thing is doing the exact same thing, I'm just going to go ahead and compute these things using TensorFlow instead. So here's what we got with NumPy. I'm just going to copy and paste 
And we're going to compute this stuff with TensorFlow. So we'll start a session. We'll call sesh.run. And we'll compute the reduced sum of these things here. So that's our TF sum. And then we're going to take the mean of it. So let's go ahead and run that. So you can see we get the exact same values here and here. Well, and here I'm just rounding it. Let me. So yeah, we get the exact same results compared to NumPy and TensorFlow. All right, now that we're all clear on how the cost function works, let's go back up here and let's define the optimizer. So the optimizer is going to be equal to tf.train and it's going to be gradient descent optimizer and we're going to pass the learning the, yeah, the learning rate can't spell or can't type and what we're going to minimize is the minim minimize is the cost so let's go ahead and run this cell and yeah we can if you want to look at that some more you can but now we're going to get into our training loop so in order to compute anything with tensorflow we need to be in a tf session so let's create that so with um, tf dot capital s session as sesh First thing we're going to do is initialize our variables. So let's do sesh.run and we're going to call tf.global variable initializer. So we'll run that and then we're going to do a for loop. So for epoch in range epochs, we're also going to do another for loop. And we're going to be doing a for loop over our batches. So for i in range um, batches, and remember what batches was. If we come back up here, we defined it as um, the number of training images we have divided by the batch size. So it's sixty thousand divided by a hundred. And then make sure you give it a, you make it an int because when you call it in range you have to pass an int in range, otherwise you get an error. So we're gonna do that. And now I'm gonna define something called the offset, and that's gonna be equal to i times the epoch. Next thing, I'm just going to, we're gonna be getting the batches of images and labels. So we're just selecting um, a small portion of images and labels. So I'm going to call that little x and that's going to be x underscore train and we're going to take we're going to start at the offset and we're going to take the offset plus the batch size and then basically the same thing for y so I'm just going to copy paste that make this a y make that a y and then the rest is the same so now what we're going to do is run the optimizer so we'll call sesh.run and what we're going to run is the optimizer and now we need to feed it some data so our feed dict is going to be equal to so we'll do capital x or our x placeholder we're going to pass our little x data and then our y placeholder we're going to pass the y data so we're just pass we're just passing in one batch of x and y data Next thing I want to do is compute the cost. So C is going to be our cost and we'll do sesh.run. We'll pass it the cost and we're basically just going to feed it the same, the same data. So let's do that. Cool. Now what I want to do is add an if statement. So if we want to see what the cost function is at each step of the training. So It'll be if not, and we'll do epoch. Well, let's just look every every epoch. Let's see what the cost function is. So then let's just go ahead and print out. We'll do an f string, and it'll be epoch. So we will print out the epoch, and then we'll also look at the cost function, and that's going to be equal to c. And let's um let's do just the first four decimal places. So if I did all this right, it should work. So fingers crossed, let's go ahead and run this. All right, we're training. So 
we're getting a cost function and it looks like it's going down a little bit not too much but at least we're not getting any errors so that's good I'll let this go ahead and finish and then we'll do some stuff to sort of see what our results is Ch check our accuracy and then just check a few sample data points or a few sample images to see how we did Cool, so now that it's training, um, I want to see how well we're performing. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to lower this to 10, our epoch, so it doesn't take so long. And I'm going to show you how we can test to see how well it's performing. So we'll come all the way outside of this, this for loop, and we're going to create something called correct prediction. So we're basically sort of setting up another graph. And it's going to be tf.equal, and what we're passing in is tf.argmax, .arg, and it's going to be the prediction by 1. And then the other thing we're going to be comparing it to or seeing if it's equal to is tf.argmax y1. So argmax, it's basically, if you have, like, say, a, an array, it's going to give you the index value of the largest value in that. So for example, um, let's come down here. If I do np.argmax of say 1, 2, and 0, I should get the, this, the index of this one. So you can see that the largest one is, is the, the first index or the, the one index. So that's how argmax works, and, it, and it's basically saying, okay, what's the predicted value, and what's the, the label value, and are they equal? So now what we need to do is we're going to define something called accuracy, and that's going to be equal to tf.reduce mean. So we're going to take the average value of all these things to see how how close they are to, um, well, see how many correct ones we've got, see how many wrong ones we've got, take the average value to get an accuracy. So it's going to be reduce mean, and then we need to do tf.cast, and what we're going to cast is the correct prediction, and what we're going to cast it to is a float32, so tf.float32. So we're basically just doing, I think this is a, this cast is the same as like as type for a NumPy array. Next thing we'll define, or we'll redefine accuracy, but we'll just create a new variable for it. So it'll be accuracy.eval. So this is sort of like, like we're running it in the session, uh, but instead of calling sesh.run, we can do eval. So we just need to basically send it a feed dict as well. So our feed dict, we can just do a dictionary. And what we're going to send it is for x, it's going to be the, let's do x test. And for y, let's do y, y test. And we'll just send all of them in just to see how they perform. And then let's go ahead and print the, um, the accuracy and cool so let's run that we'll have to go through all our training steps again just because we're not saving the graph but I lowered it to 10 so it shouldn't take that long all right so our accuracy is pretty bad we're only we're basically just getting random guesses so let's see let's try and figure out what we're doing wrong here okay we're back so when we initialize our weights and our biases originally we did random numbers and we did a normal distribution well how we initialize these weights can have a big impact on how this thing performs so if i well when i'm using the rand so the normal distribution of random numbers sometimes you can get good results or at least above like 50 60 70 percent accuracy and sometimes you don't so one thing you can do is really you want to initialize these to small values. So if I were to say, let's do um, 0 0.1 times this um, and 0 0.1 times this, 
we'll rerun all these cells and when we train here we should get a much higher accuracy more like 85 90 percent accuracy so our cost function is much lower and yeah so it can really have a big impact how you initialize these things so let's see what we get we get 88 89 percent accuracy so i want to sort of give you guys a task so I just mentioned how important the, how we initialize the weights can really affect how our network performs. So I want you guys to stop, think, and see if you can rationalize why that is, why we get better accuracy when we initialize our weights and biases to low values, basically close to zero, or we could even set these things to just zeros and we get really good performance. Whereas if we just do random values that are kind of larger, why we get poor accuracy, or sometimes it doesn't even converge and we're just getting random, random guesses. So I want you guys to think about it. And to give you a hint, think about the softmax function. So the softmax function, why don't I go ahead and show you guys what this thing looks like. So this is, let's go ahead and make a markdown cell. This is roughly what the equation for the softmax function is. If we have some x, it's e to the x divided by the sum of them. And if I were to say, let's just do a quick plot. This is what a softmax function would look like for if we had an array that's uh, 0 to 30. So again, think about how this softmax function works, um, what its properties are and why we would get better results if we initialize our, our weights and biases to low values. And comment in the comments below if you think you've got an idea why that is. Now, the last thing I wanna do is just do some simple predictions on single, single images just to see what we get. So below here, below the accuracy stuff, I'm going to, again, create some figures, and I'm just going to copy and paste this stuff to, in the interest of time. So we're going to do 10, 10 plots in a row, and this is the size we're going to do. Then I'm going to do a for loop. So, oops. So for our for loop, let me just go ahead, copy and paste that here. So we're going to do four image axes, and we're going to zip up the first 10 training images. Let, let's do the... Let's do the first 10 test images. And then we're going to define something called our guess. So our guess is gonna be np.argmax, and then we're gonna run our prediction and we're gonna feed it the image. So in this case, we're just gonna feed it image by image for the for loop. Then we're gonna take the argmax and that's gonna be our guess. So then what I wanna plot I want to plot our image and we need to reshape it because we flattened it. And then I would just want to take the axis off. So let's go ahead and run this. We need to go through all our epochs again, but it shouldn't take that long. Cool. So we're getting about 89% accuracy and we can see our results. So we guess 7, 2, 1, 0, 4, 1, 4, 9. Is thought this is a two. I'm really not sure what this is. It's definitely not a two. It's either a five or a six. I think it's a five, but, and then we get nine. So this is just how we can do predictions on single images. So I think that's gonna do it for this video. I'll go ahead and post this notebook to my GitHub. I think I still need to post the other notebook from part one, but I'll go ahead and post both notebooks to my GitHub so you can access them. There'll be a link in the description below. Um, if you got any questions, leave a comment below. I'll do my best to answer them. And think about that question I proposed earlier. Why does the network perform better when we initialize our weights and biases to smaller value? Um, yeah, smaller values. And why does it perform worse as we get bigger values? So think about that. Comment below. Um, thanks again for all the likes and subscriptions. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.